Hello and welcome to Tank and AFV News. I'm Tom and this is the 13th episode of the Tanks of World War II video series. We have been looking at the different tanks used in the Second World War and in this episode we are going to be examining the LTVZ-38 or it was more commonly known Panzerkampfwagen 38T or as we're just going to call it for the sake of convenience the Panzer 38. This is the story of the most important light tank in German service during World War II, and oddly enough, it's not even a German-designed or produced vehicle, but rather a product of the Czech firm CKD. Now, as we discussed in our last episode about the Panzer 35, in the mid-30s, the Czechoslovak military adopted the Praga-built LTVZ-35 light tank. However, this vehicle had a number of problems and issues that caused the Czechoslovak military to lose faith in the vehicle and pursue, pursue a new tank design. Now, the firm CKD, which owned Praga, had a series of designs of their own that had been developed for export sales. These had started as a small tank at developed by a Russian-born designer named Alexei Surin. Now, his designs departed from the Carden Lloyd-style vehicles of the period, and that he favored a large road wheel design rather different in appearance than, for example, the popular Vickers six-ton tank, which was one of the main competitors that the Czech firm faced. Eventually, the design work at CKD would culminate in a model called the TNH light tank. Now, this tank would win its first export order with the country of Iran, accompanied by orders from various other different CKD designs by Latvia, Peru, and Switzerland. In 1939, a sample vehicle was provided to the United Kingdom, although the British testers would find the vehicle wanting. Now, given the issues with British tank design of the period, their complaints might seem a little bit of a case of the pot calling the kettle black. However, by 1938, the TNH was accepted for service by the Czechoslovak Armed Forces under the designation LTVZ-38. That said, however, production had only started when the German occupation of Czechoslovakia occurred right before the war. Now, the Germans quickly realized the value of this new tank, choosing to keep this vehicle in production for issuance to the German Panzer Forces. In most regards, the LTVZ-38, dubbed Panzerkampfwagen 38T in German service, was superior to the German light tanks Panzer I and Panzer II, and equal in firepower to the medium Panzer III tank. Now, given that the Panzer Forces were behind schedule in receiving the Panzer III, the Panzer 38 was issued to fill in for that vehicle, particularly in the light divisions. These were units that were in the process of being upgraded to full Panzer divisions that had started off kind of as a, a way to satisfy some of the old cavalry advocates. Changes introduced by the Germans were fairly minimal, with the most serious alteration being the removal of some of the turret ammunition storage to make room for a loader, bringing the crew up to four men. Other minor changes were made, mostly converting the vehicles to German-style radios, lights, and other miscellaneous kit. While in production for the German military, the vehicle saw a number of minor changes, resulting in the models, or in the German, they would call it Ausfrung, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and S. Now, most important change was the E, which, starting with that one, they effectively doubled the armor thickness. The S version was intended to fill an export order for Sweden, but these 90 vehicles ended up being kept and pressed into German service, so they never made it to Sweden. In many ways, the Panzer 38 is rather similar to the Panzer 35 that we looked at in our last episode. Much like that vehicle, the Panzer 38 is pretty typical of late to mid-1930s tank design, being a light tank of roughly 10 tons with a 37mm gun, two machine guns, riveted armor of 1 inch or about 25mm thickness max, leaf spring suspension, and an engine for around 120 horsepower. And while that might not sound very impressive, by the standards of the late 1930s, it's fairly state-of-the-art. As stated earlier, in German service, this vehicle had a crew of four, with a loader being added after the removal of some of the turret ammunition storage. The hull housed both a driver and a radio operator, who could also operate the hull machine gun, and the vehicle was considered relatively cramped, even by the standards of the time, certainly in part because they added a fourth crewman into a turret originally designed for one man. Armament consisted of two MG-37T machine guns, one in the hull and one in the turret. Now, that's the German designation of the Czech ZB-53 machine gun, also known as the Biza. Oddly enough, that was also the standard machine gun on many British World War II tanks, though that's something we'll deal with in future videos on the British tanks, of course. 
Both machine guns were placed in a ball-style mount, similar to the system on Panzer 35, and in fact the turrets of the two vehicles are very similar in appearance. However, the main gun of the Panzer 38 is not the same 37mm gun as on the Panzer 35, being the 37mm Skoda A7 gun. Now, unlike the gun on the Panzer 35, the Skoda A7 was a purpose-designed tank gun, rather than an anti-tank gun adopted to tank use. Now, unlike the gun on the Panzer 35, the Skoda A7 does not have the rather prominent recoil cylinder over the barrel, which is a use, useful factor um, for visually IDing these two different tanks. Performance of this gun was pretty typical for a gun of its caliber, offering slightly better penetration than the German-designed 37mm KWK-36 of the Panzer III. Certainly it was better than the armament on either the Panzer I or Panzer II light tanks, and the Panzer 38 was often issued not as a replacement for those other light tanks, but for the Panzer III medium tank, due to their similar level of firepower. In fact, in early war documents, the Germans sometimes refer to the Panzer 38 as, and this is sort of confusing, the Panzer III T. The T, of course, indicating the German spelling for Czech. Armor protection on the A, B, C, and D variants was fairly limited, being at maximum 25mm at the front of the vehicle and 15mm on the sides. This meant the vehicle was vulnerable to most of the standard tank and anti-tank guns of the early war period. Probably the biggest disadvantage that the Panzer 38 had compared to German-designed tanks of the period was that the armor was riveted and considered by some of lesser quality being supposedly somewhat brittle. Most famously, German tank ace Otto Karius mentions in his memoirs that early in the Russian campaign, his Panzer 38 was hit, and more damage was done to him and the crew by the splintering of the armor and rivets popping than was done by the actual enemy projectile. As with other early war German tanks, armor levels was increased, and on the Osferung E, F, and G versions, the front and side armor was essentially doubled with 50 millimeter frontal protection and 30 millimeter on the sides. Now these tanks are recognizable to the four extra rivets on the front of the turret and the one piece flat front hull plate replacing the older versions with the recessed driver's plate. However, you have to be careful though because the Osfrong D also had the straight front plate but not the extra armor. If nothing else, the Germans really like making identify specific models of their tanks as tricky as possible for us tank enthusiasts years down the road. Mobility was provided by a Praga six-cylinder gasoline engine grossing 125 horsepower, and while not a uh, particularly impressive power output, this engine was considered one of the most reliable engines in the German tank fleet. Now, power from the engine was sent via a drive shaft to the transmission at the front of the vehicle, which had something that was similar to the way all the other German vehicles were laid out, and that went to a Praga Wilson type CV. Uh, transmission offering five forward gears and one reverse gear. Steering was done via a clutch and brake system. Top speed was 26 mile per hour and range was quite good for this era being 155 miles on road or about 60 miles off road. All in all this was a more reliable drivetrain than that found in the earlier Panzer 35 and with the front mount mounted transmission it did not require the problematic pneumatically assisted controls that plagued the Panzer 35 design. The suspension is one of the areas where the Panzer 35 differs quite markedly from the earlier Panzer 35. It features four rather large road wheels, two return rollers, a front mounted drive sprocket, and an idler in the rear. The return rollers are kind of odd in that they only support the track for the front half of the vehicle, and then the track rides on top of the last two road wheels before reaching that rear idler. While the large road wheels are sometimes confused with a Christie style suspension, the system on the Panzer 38 is actually quite different, relying on leaf springs. Furthermore, the large wheels are not in fact independently sprung like on a Christie suspension, but are uh, hung on essentially a pair of large bogies. By 1942, the Panzer 38 was obsolete as a battle tank. However, its good mechanical reliability made its chassis useful as the basis for an entire family of light-tracked vehicles. Also, these vehicles represented a way for the German military to continue to exploit the Czech production facilities. Now, we can divide these variants into two categories. Those that used the Panzer 38 hull relatively unmodified, and those that used a new hull design optimized as a gun carrier. Now, this is going to be a very quick sketch of these uh, different versions. Eventually we'll do a separate episode specifically covering German Panzerjagers and self-propelled guns. 
Also, I will be using the short versions of these vehicles' names as some of the German designations for self-propelled guns can get incredibly unwieldy and hard to pronounce. One of the first uses of the Panzer 38 chassis was as part of the Martyr series of Panzerjager, or tank destroyers. Now, these vehicles consisted of a number of different light tank hulls with 75 or 76 millimeter guns and an open mounting in response to the threat of the T-34 and KV tanks on the Eastern Front. The Panzer 38 based martyrs are often referred to as the Martyr III. Now, the SDKFZ-139, as it was designated, was a Panzer 38 hull mounting a captured Soviet 76.2 millimeter gun rechambered for German ammunition and designated 7.62 centimeter Pac 36R, with the R of course standing for Russian. Now the SDKFZ 138 also features a Panzer 38 hull, but this version of the Martyr had the standard German 7.5 centimeter Pac 40 anti tank gun. Eventually, a new optimized gun carrier hull was designed which featured the track suspension and drivetrain of the Panzer 38, but arranged differently. The radio operator position and hull machine gun were eliminated, and the engine moved to the middle of the vehicle. This created an open area in the back of the vehicle for mounting guns and housing the gun crew. This hull was used for the creation of a new Martyr III version called the SDKFZ-138M. Another vehicle was the Grill, which is German for cricket, and this was a 15 centimeter SIG infantry gun mounted on a Panzer 38 hull. Now, two versions existed, one with the gun mounted in the center of the vehicle, and a later version using the hull very similar to the late model Martyr that I mentioned earlier. There was also a munitions carrier version of the vehicle without the gun. The later style gun carrier hull was also used as the basis for an anti-aircraft tank, the Flak Panzer 38. Now this vehicle carried a single 2 cm Flak 38 gun in an open mount on the rear. Later in the war, the Panzer 38 hull was used as the basis of a reconnaissance tank called the Aufklarungs Panzer 38T. Now this vehicle consisted of a modified Panzer 38 hull mated with the open top turret from the SDKFZ-2341 armored car mounting a 2 centimeter gun. Only about 50 of these were made later in the war, around 1944 or so. The final vehicle worth mentioning is the well-known and most likely misnamed Hetzer, or Jagdpanzer 38T. Now this was not so much a variant, but a, a radical redesign using components of the Panzer 38 uh, to create a fully armored tank hunter, or light Sturmgeschütz. It's hard to, really depends on who you ask what the, the vehicle's true purpose was, uh, but this vehicle was a very common late war vehicle and it will get its own complete episode later on in this series. German panzer divisions of the early war period were not uniform in terms of their equipment or organization. The Czech-made Panzer 35 and Panzer 38 were used primarily to reinforce uh, these cavalry units known as light divisions, eventually turning into full panzer divisions following the defeat of Poland in 1939. So while the first light division would become the 6th Panzer and would be equipped with the Panzer 35, the 2nd and 3rd light divisions were equipped with the Panzer 38 and would eventually become the 7th and 8th Panzer divisions. Now these two Panzer divisions would use their Panzer 38 tanks quite successfully during the invasion of France in 1940. By 1941, the Panzer 38 would be part of the Axis forces invading the Soviet Union in service with the German 7th, 8th, 12th, 19th, 20th, and 22nd Panzer divisions, as well as the Hungarian 1st Armored Division and the Slovak Fast Division. By 1942, it was becoming increasingly clear that the Panzer 38 was no longer fit for frontline use as a battle tank, and it started to be replaced by more powerful vehicles, with the Panzer 38 production being repurposed to construct a variety of self-propelled guns and other support vehicles that we already talked about in the variant section. The Panzer 38 saw significant action in the first three years of the war, and was generally considered a successful vehicle, being prized for its reliability and ruggedness more than for its armor or firepower. That said, in the Polish and French campaigns, it did constitute a sizable percentage of the German tanks armed with an actual tank gun, as opposed to the German-built light tanks armed with machine guns and 2cm autocannon. The most notable use of the Panzer 38 in the French campaign was with the German 7th Panzer Division, commanded by an up-and-coming German general named uh, Erwin Rommel. You may have heard of him. Now, 7th Panzer was present also during the British counterattack at Arras, one of the most famous British actions of the 1940 campaign. 
The Panzer 38 did well during the 1941 invasion of Russia, although its gun was of little use against the T-34 or KV. That said, it was more than adequate for engaging the more numerous Soviet T-26 and BT tanks of that period. For those wanting to dive more deeply into the Panzer 38 on the Eastern Front, we recommend Stephen Zaloga's book, Panzer 38T vs. BT-7. Now, this book documents an interesting case study of an engagement between the 7th uh, German Panzer Division and the Soviet 5th Tank Division. Now, the outcome favored the Germans and had more to do with their greater uh, tactical experience and skill at that point in the war than with the technical differences between the two different types of tanks. The Panzer 38 is probably the most important tank we've evaluated in this series up to this point. This is due to the fact that it formed a significant part of the early war Panzer Divisions, units that played an outsized role in the Axis success in the first three years of the war. It's also one of the few pre-war vehicles that stayed in production in one form or another throughout the entire war, representing the most successful family of light-tracked vehicles used by the German army. Now, the fact that this was a product of Czech industry is a testament to the skill of the Czech designers and engineers, so fabled German engineering doesn't get credit for this one. That said, the Panzer 38 is still a fairly normal pre-war design, with many of the flaws of a pre-war design. This includes riveted armor, a cramped interior, two-man turret, 37mm gun, fairly modest power-to-weight ratio. Of course, these limitations would make it obsolete as a battle tank once machines such as the Soviet T-34 start to populate the, the battlefield. However, this is true of almost all the pre-war tanks used by every army of the period, not just the Panzer 38. What made the Panzer 38 effective in German service in 1939 through 1941 was never its firepower or its armor, but rather its mobility. And here I don't mean mobility as in blazing fast top speed. It didn't have that either, actually. What it did have, though, was reliability and range. And in the early war campaigns, the importance of mechanical reliability and range often get overlooked. If you really start to dig into the details of some of these battles in France in 1940 or Russia in 1941, it's pretty amazing just how mechanically fragile many of these early war tanks were and how ill-prepared these armies were to meet the logistical challenges to keep their tanks going. This, more than having tanks with bigger guns or better armor, was one of the keys to the success of the German Panzers. They had vehicles that could operate over distance, and they had the experience and practice at maintaining and supplying these armored units in the field that some other armies lacked. Of course, eventually the Allies would learn these skills as well, and in many ways surpass them later in the war, while the vast distances and demands put on the German Panzer forces would stretch them beyond their limits as well as later German tank designs would lack the essential ingredient of ruggedness and reliability that we see in the early war designs. However, that's another story that we shall see unfold as this series progresses into the future. If you would like to see an LTVZ-38 or a Panzer 38 in person, many still exist, and due to the success of the vehicle as an export product, they can be found in some surprising places. Now, there's really too many to list individually, but if you're like me and you're in the United States, you're going to have to travel to Europe if you want to see an actual Panzer 38. Although you can go to Peru if you want to see the slightly earlier LTP tank. Switzerland has a number of the LTH variant on display. And the wartime version Panzer 38 can be found at several locations in Russia. There's also at least one example in Slovakia, Iran, Jordan of all places, and Australia. Also, there are reproduction Panzer 38s on display in Germany and Belgium. Now, these are built on the chassis of the Swedish uh, SAV M43 assault gun, which is a post-war vehicle based on a Panzer 38 running gear. Sources used in this video include Praga LT VZ38 by Francev and Clement, Czechoslovak Armored Fighting Vehicles 1918 and 1945 by Doyle and Clement, Panzer Tracks 18 by J Jensen Doyle, Panzer 38T in Action by Clement and Doyle, Osprey New Vanguard 215 Panzer 38T by Steven Zaloga, and also by Steven Zaloga, as we mentioned earlier, Osprey Duel Panzer 38 versus BT-7. All right, well, that wraps it up uh, for this one. Uh, next week, or whenever we get the next video done, we'll probably be looking at the Panzer Three, so that'll be a, a pretty big one, and that's obviously one of the most important tanks of the war. So if you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe. Uh, you can support us on Patreon if you want, just a dollar a month. Uh, it all helps pay for better equipment, books, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, anyhow, thank you, and we will catch you on the next one.